Good afternoon. I'm Mary Thoreau, Senior Vice President at the Independent Institute, an academic research organization that develops innovative alternative solutions to seemingly intractable current challenges. It's my distinct pleasure today to get to delve into the work of Dr. Lawrence McQuillan. Lawrence is Independent Institute Senior Fellow and Director of our Center on Entrepreneurial Innovation. He's also the creator of the California Golden Fleece Award, which is bestowed on a state or local government spending program, tax, or regulation that fleeces California taxpayers, consumers, or businesses in order to combat waste, fraud, and abuse. An important component of the fleece, as with all of Independence work, is that each proposes alternative, market-based alternatives to those failed programs. Lawrence. As Californians once again flee for their lives, and others of us are sitting here coughing in acrid, smoke-filled air, um, the past several years have seen seemingly increasing numbers and intensity of wildfires. Yet we're told by government officials, the media, and other so-called experts that this is primarily the result of climate change, and it's the new normal. You clearly hold a very different view. In 2017, you awarded the Golden Fleece to CAL FIRE. And then last year, uh, you awarded the Golden Fleece again to CAL FIRE, together with the U.S. Forest Service and other government agencies for their flawed approach to wildfires. So if this isn't climate change, why are our wildfires so much more frequent and intense? Well, I think the problem with California is that for decades, there's been mismanagement of the forest land, primarily uh, with land and forest management. And what I mean by that is, I think both at the state and federal level, so we're talking about state parkland and national parkland, that the environmental lobby has captured the regulatory agencies that oversee these lands. Um, and they've kind of push this let nature run its course theory. Um, and as a result of that, the lands are, uh, the forest land in California is just desperately um, packed with excess fuels. And um, any kind of spark triggers these types of fires in the last few years, whether it's been PG&E or in this case, um, the lightning fires. So it doesn't take a whole lot to set these, fire, these forests on on fire. And as we've seen, I mean, they can very quickly rise to the state where um, it's basically impossible to manage them and control them. Just to put in perspective, in California forest land, uh, if you look at total forest land in the state, 57% of it is managed or owned by the federal government, 3% uh, by the state of California, and then the other 40% is um, privately owned land, forest land. So the government overwhelmingly has an important role to play in, in the proper maintenance of the land, and they, they just haven't. If you look at, for example, just a kind of a raw fact statistic, um, in the 1800s, there was about 500 trees per acre in Cal, or, or less than, actually, let me start over. In the 1800s, there was less than 50 trees per acre in California. Today, it's more than 500 trees per acre. So as a result, you have more densely packed uh, forest land with more trees. They're not getting proper sunlight, proper nutrients, proper water. As a result, we have 150 million dead trees in California that aren't being removed and aren't being, uh, as a result, it just stacks up more excess fuel loads for future fires. So in your Golden Fleece to CAL FIRE, you mentioned that they've shifted uh, priorities from suppression to, uh, from prevention to suppression. Right. So why is that? Well, um, it's a couple factors are driving that. So f let's look at CAL FIRE, for example. Every year, the state of California appropriates a certain amount of money to CAL FIRES. Uh, they've been using that money increasingly over time for suppression because the fires have been 
larger and larger over time because the land has been mismanaged, the fires are worse. So they've been spending that money on suppression. They don't have money then left over for prevention. As a result, then the prevention work isn't getting done, which sets up excess fuels for future years. So the fires are even more intense. And then the, again, that money is being spent through for um, suppression activities. There's not any money left then for prevention. And that's been kind of the case both with the state of California, Cal Fire, but also with the US Forest Service, the US Fire Service. Um, they've been kind of burning through all their prevention money in order to do suppression. But as a result, that sets up more intense fires for the future. Um, and so you get kind of this vicious, vicious cycle over time where you kind of, by not doing the prevention because you're fighting the current fires, you're setting up the case for even worse fires in the future. All right. So last year's fires were caused primarily by uh, equipment failures, PG and equipment. This year's fires are being caused by lightning strikes. Um, but is the resulting intensity of the wildfires, is it irrelevant of, of which is causing them in the first place? No, I mean, I think if you're in a part of the country where you're experiencing fire, the cause isn't really that important to you at, at the moment you're, you're experiencing it. Um, but you're, you're right, um, kind of in past years, 2017, 2018, the fires were caused primarily by um, faulty PG&E equipment. And keep in mind, most of this equipment is very aged. You know, we're talking 50 to 100 years old in some cases, and it hasn't been properly maintained. And we kind of go into the reasons for that later. But as a result, um, it, these failures are more and more common and they touch off fires. This year, the, the case was a little bit different um, with, the, with the lightning, which is also rare. But it's still the case that there's, it's the fuel. Is it still the case that it's the fuel that's, that's causing the right. intensity of the fires we're seeing? Right, it's just decade after decade of mismanagement of the forest land where you've had this excess fuel build up over time. Any kind of small spark can, can trigger these fires. And as we've seen, if you don't get a handle on them very quickly, they can grow to the point where they're really unmanageable and the fire almost just kind of has to burn itself out. You can try to contain it, but it's very difficult to do. So in your fleece awarded last year to CAL FIRE and the various uh, other federal and state agencies, you outlined 26 proposed solutions to it. Um, could you just talk about maybe the top one or two that you suggest as alternatives? Well, I mean, I think the the biggest thing that, or, or the thing that would make the biggest difference in terms of improving the situation would be to have more uh, quick response by local communities in order to remove this excess fuel or, and or by government. So. For example, the other day in a news conference, Gavin Newsom took credit for 35 projects that were just completed in terms of uh, removing excess fuels around the state. What he didn't tell you though, is it took a special emergency proclamation to waive the environmental rules in order for these 35 projects to go forward. So what we're looking at in California, there's thousands, if not tens of thousands of projects like this that need to be done. So if you're going to wait for a special proclamation by the governor to get these projects done, you're, you're never going to get ahead of it. You're never going to get these projects done. As a result, the fuel is just going to keep growing and growing. So I think what we need in California are um, the authority for local governments, local communities to take the lead. So this could be towns, cities, counties, and, and take the lead in terms of either doing the removal themselves or allowing private companies to go in and thin the forest, um, do salvage logging. They could make a little bit of return on their effort. And as a result, um, you know, you would suppress the, the fuel danger, um, but also at the same time, you would get this work done a lot quicker. I think there's, there needs to be authorization for like local communities to either do this work themselves or set up the contracts and to get it done quickly. Otherwise, this problem is never going to go away because we're so far behind it at this point that we need to do this stuff very rapidly. Otherwise, um, we're going to see this happen every year. 
And where would the money come from if there, if there were more local control? Well, it would either be done by the local communities would come up with the money themselves, or um, another approach would be to just provide contracts to private companies that would um, be able to sell whatever they salvage, and that would pay for the, um, the expense of doing the work. Um, so essentially, you just issue a contract. You could have a competitive bidding process. You could issue a contract to a company to go in and say, you know, you get to keep what you salvage. You can only do this much thinning. We're going to watch you make sure you don't do clear cutting. We're not talking about clear cutting. We're just talking about thinning back from, um, you know, these 500 trees per acre back down to something that's reasonable. That's not going to provide the um, excess fuel that we're seeing today. Um, so that would be part of it. Part of it is also just kind of the tedious work of actually going in there on the ground and removing low, um, low growth brush and scrub that needs to be removed. Um, you know, you're not going to make a whole lot of money selling that kind of thing, but uh, that needs to be removed. And um, the thing is, counties and you know, the local community, they know where these hotspots are. I mean, they live there, they understand the land, they see these problems, they kind of know where the problem is. And I think if you allow them to more quickly take on these challenges themselves, they would, they would hopefully do it. I think right now people are waiting around, let's, let's wait for the federal government or the state government to handle this. And as we can see, they're just poor stewards of the land. They haven't been doing it. Um, for reasons primarily because of the environmental lobby that prevents it. And the only way this is going to get done, I think, is for local communities to have more say, more control over um, doing these projects themselves and not waiting for uh, some higher up authority to, to come up with the money or the plan. Yeah, you cited an example last year of a town um, that had recently done cleanup um, and had a much improved outcome over, I think it was near Paradise, was mm -hmm. that not right? Yeah, there was a town um, right near Paradise Lake. It's just right outside of Paradise. 90% of Paradise burned down in the November of 2018, um, killing 86 people, the deadliest fire in, in California history, a wildfire. Mm -hmm. um, but this town had done three treatments over five years of the uh, surrounding area. By treatments, I mean, you know, removing overgrown uh, brush and other, um, you know, vegetation that could easily catch on fire and create a larger problem. So they did three treatments over five years. And as a result, they, they didn't see the damage that Paradise did. Um, they, they survived the fire intact. So um, I think that it's a good lesson to be learned that if you do put in the work, um, you can get ahead of it and then hopefully prevent this from happening. It's all about prevention and early detection. If you wait until the fire starts, as we've seen, I mean, these fires grow so quickly that, mm -hmm. um, that you're in peril at that point. It, these, they're out of control at that point. There's not much you can really do. Um, yeah. So you really want to put in the work in advance. And this is a, a town that went ahead and took the initiative and solved the problem for themselves. I would think insurance companies would also have an interest and perhaps be part of the uh, impetus to be doing more of this mm -hmm. if they well, were allowed to privately. Right. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the towns and cities of California are self-insured. Um, but you're right in terms of the houses, though. I mean, a lot of insurance companies, well, a lot of them now refuse to to cover property, you know, underwrite property in, in like the Paradise area, for example. They've all pulled out. But they but ones that are remaining you know are saying here's some ways to harden your property to make it more resilient against fire and doing you know common sense things like creating a safe zone around your house um and i mean there's other things you can do in terms of external sprinklers that there's some evidence that's highly effective and because most homes that burn don't burn because of contact with the flames they burn because of flying embers that land either on the roof of the house or in the gutters. So there's also gutter shields, gutter guards that you can put on your home to help pr uh, prevent that problem. Um, so yeah, there's there's many steps that people are, can take and have taken that show that you know these other steps can be very highly effective. There's a 
fire, a famous fire in Minnesota, the Ham Lake fire, where they had installed as part of a pilot project, they installed external sprinklers on 188 homes and all but one home survived the fire. Um, hmm. And, but much of the town didn't, that didn't have these sprinklers on. Um, so these are fairly inexpensive sprinklers that you can put on your home, sometimes even by yourself if you want to. Um, and there is, you know, evidence that this does make a big difference in terms of protecting your home. You earlier touched on the extreme age of PG&E's equipment, uh, which has been a huge contributor to certainly the prior year's fires. Um, why is there why is their infrastructure so old, and um, what should they be investing in? Well, the, what they should be investing in, obviously, is customer safety, and they haven't been doing that. Um, and as a result, you know, we've seen the tragedies that we've seen. The Paradise Fire, ultimately, the conclusion was that was caused by like a nearly 100-year-old part failing on a transmission uh, tower uh, or distribution line. And um, so as a result, you know, their, their equipment is aged, it's prone to failure, but instead of putting money into that, they've been uh, oftentimes dictated by either state legislatures or regulators um, to put money into green projects, for example. And so over the last few years, they've invested about $2.5 billion in green investments. So solar, windmills, that type of thing, um, rather than putting it into upgrading and hardening and strengthening their, uh, you know, their grid, their infrastructure, which I think is, has been shown to be a huge failure on their, on, well, uh, partially on their fault, but partially uh, probably more so on the part of legislators and regulators who have demanded this. They're they kind of are in somewhat at the mercy of the regulators because they tell them, okay, we approve your spending if you spend it in this way. So, um, so their, their hands are somewhat tied. I will say though, PG&E isn't blameless because as of last year, late last year, they had only spent one third of the money that was allocated by the, and approved by the California Public Utility Commission for uh, removing vegetation around their power lines. So, they, so they've had you know, money allocated in the past that they haven't fully spent or spent as quickly maybe as we'd like to see them spend it. And so they're not completely blameless themselves, but they are dictated to, by, to a large extent by um, indirectly by the California Environmental Lobby, but also you know, through the CPUC and state legislature. There's the CPUC also has the power to find PG&E a um, large amount, I think it's $50,000 a day for safety violations, and they've never done it. Um, last year, I got involved in a, <laughs> I, at least a two-week conversation on Nextdoor when I made a post um, in the midst of a, last year's wildfires saying, uh, you know, do, don't look to climate change, look to uh, PG&E and the PUC as the culprits behind our suffering these things and had just a lot of pushback that, oh, no, it was PG&E paying huge bonuses to its CEO and executives and paying out huge dividends. Um, and I was trying to point out that everything that PG&E does has to be approved by the PUC, that yes, PG&E is not blameless in its decision making, but ultimately, they're answerable to Sacramento, they're not answerable to their customers, mm -hmm. um, and that we we individual citizens and customers should be putting the pressure on Sacramento if we wanted to see improvements to the better. Um, anyway, it was a very long and uh, interesting conversation. Um, I also had suggested that uh, many of your recommendations I posted of the, of the technological improvements that PG&E could be making that you cited that other utilities um, make and, and that they could, since they had already achieved, uh, I think it's 85% of the 100% renewable goal that they're supposed to hit by 2045, but they're already 85% of the way there. And I think you were pointing out that they could therefore divert some of this investment in continuing green, pause that for a minute, and put it into some of these technological um, improvements. 
And I don't remember all of the uh, technology that you cited that other utilities um, are doing on a on a fairly regular basis, but uh, mm -hmm. it certainly made sense to me. Well, for example, San Diego Gas and Electric, they've undergrounded, I think, about 60% of their power lines at this point, especially in, in hard to get to parts of, of their territory and um, fire prone areas. So they've kind of started there and they're working out from there. Um, and so there's things like that. You can underground power lines, you can insulate the overhead power lines. Um, another thing that San Diego Gas and Electric has done is they've had scientists that have worked on a quick shutoff mechanism. So if a power fails on a line, they can actually shut the line down before, for example, the pole hits the ground, they can cut the power off to that line. So they can quickly detect that there's a problem, cut off the power before, for example, a pole in, in the uh, hot power line would hit the ground and, and potentially spark a fire. Um, so th those are some of the things that they're doing in, in the San Diego area. Um, other things that could be done, well, for example, California has invested more in infrared cameras. So we have a more extensive network of cameras in California than we used to have, but we could certainly do more in that regard. Um, and they've invested, for example, in more helicopters, um, the very latest technology. I think they're called Firehawks made by um, Lockheed Martin. And they, they received some of those. Newsom had a big press conference unveiling those. The, the good thing about those is they can fly at night, whereas the old helicopters that the state of California had, they couldn't. And nighttime firefighting is highly effective because the winds tend to drop overnight. The humidity goes up. It's just easier typically to fight, fight a fire at night if you have that night vision capability and these do. Whereas the old, we had old Vietnam War era helicopters that didn't have that capability. So that, that's a, a, a nice upgrade. Um, but again, um, the nitty gritty is gonna be fought on the ground. It's, it's doing all this fuel removal. You can have all the technology, but if you're waiting that long to respond until the fire is blazing, you're, you're in big trouble at that point. I mean, what you wanna invest in is, and we can talk a little bit about that, but is more prevention and early detection of these fires so that you get the assets out in front of the fire um, so there's some tech that we could talk about now, if you want to, that would um, enable that. Sure. So um, tell us about that. Sure. So I mean, one of the things that is being done around the world is this is um, both in Spain and in Finland. Uh, well, Finland, for example, they have they sectionalize their um, forests, so they create kind of sections where each section is responsible for its own fire prevention and, and fire suppression. And they put um, Internet of Things sensors throughout the forest. And they monitor things in real time, such as temperature, humidity, CO2 levels. And some of them are hooked up, hooked up to cameras as well. So the, the intent is to spot a fire very quickly. And then you have local resources in each of these sections that are kind of rapid response units that move in and suppress the fire very quickly. Um, and, and another thing kind of along the same lines is um, there's uh, a lot of AI being developed around the world to focus on wildfire. And the point is um, there's one at University of California, Berkeley that's being developed, it's called Fuego. And the point is to um, not only, uh, it's a system of drones and satellites that is intended to detect a fire very early on, but also it's meant to predict where that fire is gonna to move to. And that's really key to fighting in a fire is to be able to accurately predict where it's gonna go so you can get your resources, men and machinery ahead of the fire. Um, and so that's another AI device that's being developed to predict where, um, not only where fires start, but also where they're gonna to head to once they do start. Um, so there's lots of technology like that. Um, there's another uh, high-tech device that's called LIDAR that is installed on uh, planes and helicopters and it can fly over forest land and it basically kind of reads the 
composition of the fuel bed in the forest. So it kind of reads how much fuel there is there. So you can kind of target where you want to go in and surgically remove the fuel. So it kind of gives you an overall map or picture of what the fuel composition is in a forest. Um, so that's another useful new, new high-tech device that's being uh, unveiled around the world to fight fires. And unfortunately, U.S. and in, in California is behind in terms of adopting a lot of technology. Uh, many other countries, especially in Europe and Australia, are way ahead of us in terms of um, using this new technology as a crucial part of the firefighting and fire prevention, even more important, fire prevention effort. So here we pride ourselves on being in the, the middle of the Silicon Valley, and you cited UC Berkeley developing this, which is right, right here as well. Um, and you're the head of our Center on Entrepreneurial Innovation. So what's it going to take to get uh, this innovation into the gov sphere? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's a great question. Um, yeah, government is very slow, especially in California. Um, we have another report coming out in a, in a few days, actually, on IT failures in California by government. I mean, it's very common for there to be repeated failures of technology trying to do the same thing over and over and it just keeps failing and they keep putting more money into it. Um, I mean, I think again, the more that these decisions can be made at the local level. And um, I mean, I'm not, I don't think many counties could probably afford their own Firehawk helicopter. Some could, but not all. And so I think, um, you know, th this would have to be a kind of a coordinated effort to, to be able to afford some of this technology. But I, I think that communities are probably at the point now where they've seen enough of this disaster and death and want to take more control over it. And I think if cities and towns and counties would start lobbying in Sacramento and say, let us handle some of this on our own, give us the flexibility to do it. Um, and, and I think, um, you'd see more of this technology adopted. It's interesting because during the uh, COVID pandemic, we've seen a lot of restrictions eased. And as a result, uh, apparently localities have figured out that they can, uh, they can source technology directly. This is a negative example, I'd say, but uh, there have been multiple, at least 30 communities around the United States who have bought the Chinese technology, the drone technology, that will allow them to track people ostensibly to detect quarantine violations and other things. So they're doing it in that instance um, in the guise of emergency. And if wildfires don't present enough of an emergency to allow the, uh, again, uh, localities to step up and do things that they're currently not allowed to, I don't, I'm not sure what it's going to take. But those yeah. are... Great examples. I mean, another Thank example you. of kind of the over centralization of this firefighting and fire prevention is in California, we have um, 44 fire camps. And these are camps scattered around the state that um, have prison firefighting crews, but also some Cal Fire fighting crews as well. Um, but if you think about it, there's 44 of these camps, there's 58 counties in California. So there's not even a camp for every county, which I, I, to me, it just seems like if you live in a county, you'd want to have a camp there of kind of a rapid response team or, or a team that's least focused on your county all year yes. and doesn't go anywhere else and does this fuel reduction work that needs to be done all year and doesn't go anywhere else. And I think the fact that we're at, counties are actually sharing Fire camps doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. I mean, it seems like every county at least should have its own kind of strike team that can rapidly respond. And when they're not responding, they would do this um, very tedious but very important work of fuel reduction throughout the year. Yeah, good. Um, shifting gears a little bit, um, adding insult to injury. Uh, starting last year, in addition to wildfires, we're now getting blackouts. Uh, last year's was uh, PG&E did them preemptively 
to shut off uh, equipment that they thought might spark additional fires. And this year, interestingly enough, it turns out that when the sun goes down, uh, California doesn't have enough energy being generated because of its extreme reliance on solar. And they haven't been able to uh, source enough to offset that. So they're turning off the lights, turning off our all power at night. Um, so the question is, what's the common denominator between both of those reasons for PG&E to uh, turn off? They're increasingly being called green outs. Do you agree that it's primarily a result of um, going too far to the green energy policy? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that's the common denominator is that they don't have either modern equipment or enough equipment um, to provide the power safely to Californians, um, or they haven't set up the contracts in order to bring in power when, when they need it. But ideally, you'd want to, I would think, generate it yourself rather than have to go looking outside the state for it. Um, but again, yeah, again, I think that, you know, in California, we have these behemoth regional monopolies um, that have state protected uh, regions that they can provide power for. PG&E, for example, has a 500, or, yeah, 500 mile stretch of California from basically Bakersfield up to Eureka that they provide uh, power for. And you have to wonder, you know, have these monopoly protected regions grown to the extent that they no longer can provide the maintenance that needs to be done efficiently and effectively. Um, you know, it's possible that they're, they're, they're too big to succeed in a way rather than too big to fail, that, that the territorial areas is so big in, in the amount of, you know, land management that needs to be done in order to provide safe power is just too vast for them to actually keep up with it at this point. Um, so maybe we need more open, decentralized, competitive electricity markets. Uh, that might be a good start. And they would provide the, the mix of sources for energy that the customer would want rather than what's dictated by the politicians in Sacramento. So you don't agree that power is a natural monopoly? The no, I mean, there's been a lot of work to show um, uh, by, well, Thomas DiLorenzo for one, who's looked into this and, um, you know, the early electric markets were highly competitive, not, not just in California, but around the United States. You often consumers had multiple options. Um, same thing with water in California. Oftentimes in early California, you had multiple options until the government stepped in and um, started to support kind of the, the largest incumbents and mm -hmm. disadvantaged the, the smaller competitors and forced them out over time. Um, but yeah, most of these markets that are considered, you know, natural monopolies were only one, uh, source can efi efficiently and effectively serve the customers is not the way history shows that uh, these markets used to be. They were actually highly competitive at one point. And are there examples currently of competitive energy markets? Um, well, there's certainly examples of small um, customer owned electricity markets right here in California that have avoided most of the problems by PG&E. Alameda, for example, is one of them. They have their own power company. Um, Sacramento has a invest or customer owned um, utility that provides electricity there. Um, again, they're, they're smaller, but they, it's a territory that's more manageable than these huge regional monopolies that are um, protected by the state given to a, you know, a few of these three, three in particular in California. So, um, so I think it, it does show that maybe you can do a much more effective way of serving the customer and making sure they're protected and have the power they need at a reasonable price by, by having a smaller focus in a smaller territory. Right. So instead, uh, we in California are paying, have, are paying 40% higher prices over the past five years, whereas I guess in the rest of the country, it's been about 15% growth. Mm -hmm. And we pay twice as much as Oregon or Washington, which are our near neighbors. 
Um, so uh, we're certainly not getting much of a bargain. And then on top of that, we get these wildfires. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, so they, it's yeah. no it's no bargain, that's for sure. I mean, you're paying higher rates and you're getting less safety for it. And we're not we're not getting and, a clean and environment less, and less reliability in terms of the product and a dirtier environment. So they claim they're doing all these changes, this green energy so that the environment will be cleaner. But instead, we have wildfires, which are producing very dangerous air mm -hmm. and much greater emissions than can imagine any number of power plants would be producing. Right. Yeah. I've seen many studies that show the air, you know, the air quality around wildfire is much worse than anything that a power plant, for example, would emit. Uh, it's got it's got to offset all the green uh, that's being mm -hmm. that's being promised. And it's every and year the, now. It's not not an yeah. unusual situation. It's it is every year. And now that you and multiple and, times every year. And then you compound it with the with the blackouts, and then people fire up their gas generated generate gas powered generators, which also produce emissions. So it's kind of a mm -hmm. a, a vicious catch twenty two. And we had a really interesting political uh, uh, situation last week. Of course, it's convention season, so Thursday night, Gavin Newsom had a a, a major. Uh, showcase at the Democratic National Convention. He he broadcast from a fire zone um, and was touting that climate change is real and so on, and really went after Trump for uh, claiming that the wildfires are a result of California's mismanagement of its vegetation. Uh, just made, made fun of that as a contention. Um, but interestingly, then the very next morning, Newsom held a press conference in Sacramento at which he started he was praising the relationship that he and Trump have uh, he said Trump answers all of his calls promptly um, and he also offered Trump an excuse for the tweet that he had done on Thursday attacking California for not managing its vegetation he said uh, Newsom said I'm not convinced that the president was aware of the new memorandum of understanding that his administration signed with the state of California to collectively invest an unprecedented amount of resources to address the concern he highlighted. Had he been aware of that, I'm not sure he would have made that statement. And I respect that the president has a lot on his plate. Um, so a couple of <laughs> reactions that I had to seeing this is, um, well, one, the political one, you know, why is Newsom doing this doublespeak where he tells the DNC he makes fun of Trump at the DNC, but the next morning he's acting like he and Trump are best buddies. Mm -hmm. Well, it's know your audience, right? <laughs> I mean, Newsom knew who his audience was that night. It's, you know, Democratic faithfuls, and he told them what they wanted to hear. And then the next day or whenever that next announcement was, he was basically talking to Trump, I think, saying, thank you for moving us in the, in the direction where we can start to maybe take down some of this excess fuel uh, load and, um, you know, do some more prevention. And so I think he, yeah, I mean, he's trying to play it both ways, thinking that the people at the DNC convention will never hear what he said the next day, which is probably true. Um, but I mean, I think um, that if we're, we're going to politicize this issue, we're in big trouble because this is literally life yeah. or death in California. Yeah. And, and I think Newsom realizes by these 35 projects he did and the waivers he gave, it's essentially a, an admission that the past approach didn't work, that it was too controlled by, by the environmental lobby and as a result, important work wasn't getting done. And also it's a recognition that the federal government owns 57% of California forest land. So if prevention work is gonna get done and you're gonna start removing some of this excess fuel is going to require, you know, the feds to at least acknowledge it. And, and oftentimes when this work is done, they, they partner with the state. So it's the federal government usually doesn't send in a, it's entirely its own team to do this work. So it is kind of a partnership. So I think he, you know, Newsom is kind of tipping his hat to Trump and saying, recognizing the fact that they're going to have to do this together. But, um, 
But I think if you're going to rely on the governments, either state or the federal, to fix this problem, you're going to be seeing these types of fires every year, multiple times a year. It's just too big. They're, they're too far behind the curve in terms of removing this excess fuel. And what you need to do is free it up and allow, you know, entrepreneurs to go in there and solve this problem quickly. Um, otherwise, I, I can't see this happening at the pace that needs to be done. In fact, I think a lot of the lightning fires started in on federal lands um, and recently, you know, the, the ones that we were talking about earlier. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, you know, it's a recognition by Newsom that he needs federal help to some extent, but, um, but I would like to see them make it, if you look back in history, uh, land was, you know, it was controlled by logging companies for the most part. They had roads that went back into these forests where you could use those roads to fight fires. Most of these roads now are no longer accessible. Um, they've been overgrown. So you, it's almost impossible to get crews back into these forests anymore. Um, and, you know, they, they managed the land because they didn't want to see their assets go up in flames. Um, you know, the old saying is nobody washes a rental car. You know, you take care of what you own. And the same mm -hmm. thing applies to um, forest land is that state and local government has done a terrible job of providing proper stewardship of this land. They've allowed this land to just be overgrown and burned to the ground. And but a private company or a private, even a private uh, environmental group, let's say, for example, the Nature Conservancy owned this land they wouldn't want to see this land burned to the ground either. I mean, they'd want to properly maintain the, the land. Sure, maybe in some locations, the best thing to do would be to let it burn because it's very inaccessible. There's no nobody living there. Um, so let like have prescribed burns or have natural low intensity fires run its course. But most of the time, I think even a, a like an, an environmental group, if it if a trust owned it, a private trust owned it, they wouldn't want to see it go up in flames either because it has multiple uses and you don't want to see your assets go up in flames. It's interesting because there's a, there was an article in today's um, paper about uh, increasing investments by power companies in forest lands as carbon offset credits. Um, California currently requires it and the handwriting on the wall says that others will too. And vast amounts of money are being invested by companies like BP to buy trees or to, you know, essentially, and you would think, so, mm -hmm. you know, that could be a business proposition too, is I will sell you a well, man I will sell you and manage a forest as your carbon offset. And then it is behooves that entrepreneur or as you say, environmental group to maintain that forest such that it is actually providing mm -hmm live, healthy trees versus emissions from wildfires, mm -hmm. uh, for example. So there are just lots and lots of um, ways that uh, things could be structured better if, again, it gets out of the control of the feds and the state. Right. Yeah. And if you think, too, 40% um, of California forest land is privately owned, either by individuals or companies or trusts or uh, native uh, American Indian tribes, um, but but they don't control how that land is can be managed. It's basically this land is an extension of the state government because the state government has so many controls over what you can do in terms of removing excess fuels. Like if you if you want to do that in California, you have to get a timber harvesting permit. Then if you 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 have to hire a company that has a permit from the state of California that it's been certified as, as a um, proper uh, timber harvesting company. Um, and this can take months, if not years. And if you wanna do a prescribed burn, for example, um, then the regional air quality management uh, authorities can step in and, and repeatedly say, oh, well, you can't do it now you, because it would contaminate the air, even though a, a resulting, as we mentioned, I mean, a resulting wildfire is going to contaminate the air far worse than a prescribed burn would do, for example. Um, so, but in other states, for example, Arizona, they, if you call them up and try to get and ask for a, a 
timber harvesting permit, they'll try to get you that permit that day. It's that quick. Whereas in and then California, you mentioned that that Georgia will issue a mm -hmm. prescribed burn permit the same day. Yeah, as well, over right? the phone, yeah. basically. Yeah. Um, so other states do it rapidly um, because they realize delay can lead to far worse problems. Yeah. But in California, it can be months, if not years, before you can actually even use the permit that you got to do the clearing that you want to do. It's and in the meantime, it might have been burned down. Yeah, so. <laughs> in the meantime, you could have started wildfires that were far worse in terms of contaminating the air. Oh. Uh, one last question for me, then I'm going to look at the questions we have from our viewers. Um, one of the metrics that's used to support a claim of extreme climate change is uh, property damage um, that's resulting from natural disasters. So hurricanes are more virulent because there's more dollar uh, damage resulting and so on. Independent did a study a few years ago on this showing that it's actually a result of more people building in flood prone areas mm -hmm. in hurricane prone areas and so on. And that's what's produced far more damage. It's not that the storms themselves are, in fact, the storms themselves are actually less frequent. Um, but using that metric is uh, an unhelpful uh, uh, underlier of yes, climate change is a real problem. And I know you talk uh, in your fleece as well about um, housing regulations in California resulting in people going farther into interface with uh, forest lands and that also contributing to this problem. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Right, yeah. In California today, there's 4.4 million homes now that have been built in what's called the wildland urban interface. So because regulations have gotten worse and worse and it's nearly impossible to build a, a single family home or a, for certainly a, a multifamily home like an apartment complex in much of the state, uh, building has taken place further out of the city area into much more of the interface between wildland and, and residential land. And, and so then if you do have a fire, um, you're more likely to have significant structural damage, particularly residential homes than years past. So if you use that measure that you mentioned of, you know, the value of property destroyed or something, of course, it's going to look worse because people are moving in, into more risk prone areas as a result of all the impediments to housing development in other parts of the state. So all of these regulations actually kind of compound the problem in terms of putting more people in hazard. Uh, and more people at risk of being uh, either, you know, losing their property or losing their life from wildfires in California. And the natural concurrent uh, solution to that would be, again, devolving the authority for uh, managing vegetation around there to those people who are moving into the areas, to the communities that right. are moving into the areas. And, and or yeah. to also free up... Um, you know, deregulate the housing market and allow more houses to get built closer to where perhaps people want to live, uh, not mm -hmm. where they can afford to live. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a saying in real estate, drive until you qualify type of thing. You know, you just keep driving further and further out until you can afford a, a home because the homes near, uh, you know, where more people want to live are just so unaffordable because of all the zoning and the land use restrictions and, um, you know, for certain regulations that make labor costs higher to build in California than other states. So all of that encourages people then to move out further. And as a result, though, they start um, bumping up against the more fire prone areas. Right. Okay, I'm going to uh, move to questions from viewers on. So uh, Sarah Nowak asks, a friend recently posted an infographic on social media about using California's prison labor to fight the fires. Can you please give more insight on this? Is this truly something they have done in the past? They have. As I mentioned, there's 44 fire camps uh, spread throughout California. Each camp has about 15 to 20 uh, inmates, prisoners that are on leave to uh, fight fires. And so these, these uh, firefighting crews, prison crews have been really important in terms of um, California's effort against fires. Um, and as a result of, of their 
and, and they do, they're, they're on what's called hand crews. So they do a lot of the um, digging of uh, fuel brakes and fire brakes. It's tedious, backbreaking work. It's very difficult. And uh, actually, we're really thankful to have that kind of labor available. Uh, as a result of doing that work, they get a reduction in their sentence. Um, so it's been helpful. But, and as I think you mentioned earlier, Mary, that I think several of these camps have been closed though this year because uh, the coronavirus outbreak in these camps. So they had to shut them down and they sent the inmates home. So that cuts back in the number of uh, prison crews that you have out there on the lines fighting the fires. So yeah, um, well, it, was, it was pointed out in Newsom's news conference the other day that there are fewer prisoners available for this program because um, a lot of prisoners were released because of the fear that yeah. coronavirus would go through the prisons. And then um, prisons are on lockdown, so they can't send the prisoners out. And as you pointed out in the fleece either last year or three years ago, that, I mean, it's also, it's win-win. The prisoners get a reduced prison sentence and the cost of prison labor is such a fraction mm -hmm. of um, the alternative labor that's available that it's a real win for taxpayers and and um, those of us who want to be protected right. from wildfires. Yeah, I mean, they do a, a great service to the state. I mean, it's it's very risky and very difficult work to do, but it's very important to dig these fuel breaks and fire breaks. Um, but, um, but yeah, it, there's also a regulation that, that makes it almost impossible for them to be hired after they're released to be hired as firefighters, which in some cases I can kind of understand. But, and, and, you know, for the less, uh, those are nonviolent criminals that are in there. I think that would might be a really good uh, career path for them once they get out because they have so much experience doing this work that's been vital to California's effort. Uh, you you touched on this, and maybe you touched on it enough to answer this question. The question may have came come before we talked about it, but um, Robota Scats asks, is there a role for the tech companies in California in wildfire mi mitigation? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, there's a greater need for that than ever before, as, as we've seen with the recent fires that we're not um, as tech savvy as we'd like to think we are here in California. Um, you know, we got some of the great tech minds in, in the world right here in, in the Valley and scattered throughout other parts of California, but getting that tech adopted and used has been a very difficult thing um, in government. So again, the more that we, I think, could invite the private sector into it, I think the more innovative they would be and more they would display i think more urgency to solve this problem because again you don't want to see uh, your valuable assets go up in flames i mean you want to preserve it and use it for future benefit um, so i think they'd be much more willing to adopt high high-tech solutions than the government has been um, and, and the government also I mean, frankly, we don't have enough. I don't think we have enough firefighters fire, because we don't have people out there that can quickly respond um, to put these things out before they grow to the extent that, that we've seen in recent years. So the, the tech would work in combination with the labor. Um, the tech would kind of give you advance notice of where prevention efforts have to be focused and um, you know, removing the excess fuels and that sort of thing. Um, and then also the tech could alert you when a fire does start, where it is, where it's gonna move to, um, what assets need to be moved in advance to get ahead of it, and, um, and then have sufficient labor spread out throughout the state to rapidly uh, resolve these. I think local communities have kind of bowed to Sacramento far too much and think, okay, we have Cal Fire, we put a lot of money into it, they must be doing the job. And so we don't take control over this problem ourselves, but they're not doing the job. I mean, it's obvious they're not doing the job. We've just seen way too much death and destruction to, to, to know and believe that line anymore. Um, so yeah. I think what we need to do is have a much more local private initiative and one of them is obviously the tech companies that can do 
um, a lot more than what is currently being done for early detection and prevention. Of course, it's not unusual to see the government push out well-functioning local or mutual aid um, uh, arrangements which existed by coming in and promising, well, we're going to provide this service. And so the other the, the people and the, the organizations that we're providing the service kind of fade away. So we have far fewer volunteer fire departments, for example, than we used to. Um, I think, I'm not sure, but I think that's also a result of um, firefighters now being required to be um, EDS and other things rather than just volunteer firefighters. Um, there's also, uh, there's some interesting examples we saw last year of private firefighters coming in. Mm -hmm. So famously, um, Kim Kardashian's home was saved by private firefighters, which I believe were provided by their insurance company. Yeah, that's correct. And there have been other examples of insurance companies that, that uh, contract private firefighting um, to protect their policyholders' property. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another, so, so volunteer organizations, private and more local, I think combined could uh, help fill that gap mm -hmm. um, quite well. And, and the regular fire crews, they don't mind seeing these private uh, crews come in typically sure. because it frees them up then to focus their resources on other areas. Um, yeah. But I, I would think, you know, if you had much more of a well-functioning insurance market in California that you'd see insurance companies provide that option more um, to homeowners to provide kind of a private firefighting option. Um, but then, then again, that frees up the other firefighters to go out there and, and pursue the fire elsewhere. So um, I think more resources is always a good thing when you're fighting these things. Yeah, insurance is, is interesting because um, we lived in Oakland during the Oakland fire of 91, which destroyed thousands of homes and killed too many people. Um, and in the aftermath of that, the state of California forced the insurance companies not to replace the homes that had been burned down um, of, a, of a similar size and, and, and state as the house that burned down, but they, they were making them pay for houses that were two or three times the size of the house that burned down, that had custom architecture and custom. We had friends who rebuilt and they had a beautiful artistic door that they had imported from New Mexico or someplace. Um, so the houses that replaced the houses that burned down were, were many times more expensive um, than the ones that had, had been destroyed. And in the aftermath of that, almost every home insurance company left mm -hmm. the Oakland Hills, and most a lot of them left California market completely. Um, we continue to live in what is designated a fire area of Oakland, and we've been canceled and canceled and canceled. Mm -hmm. um, we're now, I think, on the last insurance company we can get before we're going to have to go to the state as the insurer of last resort. I know in your fleece, one of your recommendations was um, freeing up the insurance market and across state lines as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh -huh. it's a major problem. Um, insurers are leaving California in droves for various reasons, but this is one of them. Um, and as a result, a lot of places can't get coverage anymore. A lot of homes and uh, some people are leaving the state over it because they just can't get coverage for their home anymore. Um, yeah, it's a big problem. And I think if you had a much more uh, competitive insurance market where they could rate and, and uh, charge based on the true underlying risk, which they're not uh, um, allowed to in many cases here in California, um, you, you at least see coverage again in many parts of the state. It might be expensive, there's no doubt about it, but you'd see at least insurers return to the state because they can then charge a price that covers the actual risk of that property. Right, and plus bring some of these added benefits like having options for mm -hmm. um, 
or incentives to hardscape your home, uh, perhaps selling uh, as part of their policy the the firefighting mm-hmm. and so on. We Lawrence, you thought an hour was going to be a long time, and we've got used we're up there. Our time. Unfortunately, we've used up our time. Um, we had some more questions, but I think this has been really interesting. Um, hopefully, it's been helpful to those who have tuned in. And I thank you so much. I've learned thank a you, lot. Mary. Take care. Thank you.